Welcome everyone to our latest edition of AJOT Authors and Issues. Here on the Authors and Issues series, we like to talk to authors about their research and other things to help bridge the gap between research and practice. My name is Stacey Reynolds. I am the Editor-in-Chief of AJOT. And uh, leading our session today with me is the AJOT student representative, Sabrina Hinckley, who is an OTD student at Virginia Commonwealth University. And our guests today are Dr. Beth Fields and Chloe Montefering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Dr. Jeanette Christensen from the University of Southern Denmark. Uh, they are authors on an Issue Is paper recently published in AJOT called Going Beyond Management and Maintenance, Occupational Therapy's Role in Primary Prevention for Adults at Risk for Obesity. So we are very excited to talk about this topic today and have all these amazing uh, authors here. Um, and I'd like to have you all start by just telling us a little bit about yourself, where you are zooming in from, and maybe the history behind how you all work together on this paper. So my name's Chloe, as you said, Stacy, and I'm a PhD candidate here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I worked previously in practice as an OT in multiple settings before coming back to get my PhD and really have had an interest in primary prevention um, interventions and the role that occupational therapists can play. And I had the privilege of getting to go to the World Federation of Occupational Therapists um, last summer and um, got to listen to one of Jeanette's presentations that she was doing there on their Danish obesity intervention trial or the do it study as they call it. Um, and with my own research interests, I was really excited to hear about the work that they were doing um, in Denmark. And we had the opportunity to connect briefly there at the conference. Um, and then fast forward to this past, um, past fall, Beth and I were beginning to work on this paper with my own research interests. And um, we decided that it would be a really great opportunity to reconnect with Jeanette, given her expertise. We felt that she would really strengthen um, the understanding that we were bringing to this paper. So um, we're really glad that uh, she was able to offer her, her insight and um, knowledge to this paper. I love that. I love that international collaboration, too. Mm -hmm. Jeanette, can you tell us a little bit more about where where you are right now and the what how you came into this and your thoughts on on this collaboration? Yeah, uh, yeah, and thank you for the very sweet words, Chloe. <laughs> um, yeah, we've been talking many hours since then, uh, so I know uh, Chloe and Beth now quite well. Um, yes, I'm in. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Jeanette Christensen, and I'm from the University of Southern Denmark, but also from the Aarhus University. So I'm actually kind of divided within this associate professor role. And until 14 days ago, I was also the head of master's, actually, at the uh, programs of OTs in Denmark. We only have one master's program in Denmark, and I've been heading that for the last uh, eight years. But now I've kind of dedicated all my hours for research. So that's very lovely. So I think we're going to jump very fast from here. Um, as I said, I'm an, I'm an OT as well. And it's kind of built a bit differently in Denmark. We all have BAs in OT in Denmark. You can't be an OT without a BA. Uh, and only some have only masters on top of it as well, not all of them. And, and then I have a PhD in sports science. So I'm kind of divided in several areas. Um, and many years ago, I, I did my own PhD study actually on ergonomics and people having back pains. And I thought I was going to do OT studies within ergonomics. It showed that the population that I was working with were very obese and had a lot of problems actually due to body size and body volume. So we had to do things differently. So I looked um, towards the States. And I actually went over and met Florence Clark before she went on her pension. So there I wrapped up with uh, Chantal Rice and the Piatex, which I've seen here also at AJAT presenting a lifestyle redesign. So we actually looked uh, to you guys and what you have done as well. 
And um, and then I wrapped up with some of my own um, earlier studies, actually looking in what has actually helped um, people with different um, functional problems in different ways. So we did a study called Finale 10 years ago, also about kind of obesity, turned to the freedom study, free of lifestyle diseases. So now going to the more preventive and now the do it study where we're actually going into the preventive area. So we have been on, on this journey for uh, 15 years or so uh, and done a lot of studies on the, the do it and the freedom and the finale study. So that was what I was presenting at Paris where I met Chloe and that's what our cooperation, but I also cooperate actually with uh, USC and the researchers over there, as well as um, Heather Fritz from earlier Wayne State University about habit studies. So um, yeah, so it's 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 so wonderful that it's now you know um, enlarging the cooperation uh, from Europe to US. I love that. And Beth, how did you get wrapped into all of this? <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity to be here with everyone this, uh, well, for us, it's still morning. Um, yeah, so I am an assistant professor, as you mentioned, Stacey, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I run the Geriatric Health Services Research Lab. And a few years back, Chloe reached out to me when she was exploring PhD programs, and we really just connected right away at the beginning based on our overlapping interests. Um, Chloe's always had um, an interest as well as I in like aging, chronic conditions, occupational therapy, as well as like primary prevention and public health. Um, so I uh, had the opportunity to invite Chloe here for a visit. She decided to um, come and work in my lab. Um, and as she mentioned, she's now a PhD candidate and doing great things and about to start her dissertation. And she connected me with um, Jeanette. So it's just been a wonderful collaboration that's happened over the past few years. Um, and I'm really excited to discuss the piece we're going to get into here with the next few questions. Absolutely. And we can jump into that now. Um, so the article that we're here to discuss, it, it talks about obesity and I'm just going to define obesity so everybody's on the same page. We'll use the World Health Definition, World Health Organization definition, which is um, they define obesity as abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that presents as a risk to health. And as many of our listeners know, obesity is a major public health issue here in the States and in other parts of the world as well. And in this article, you discuss um, reactive and proactive approaches to obesity. And, and you note that the US healthcare system um, tends to, to address obesity in a more reactive way. And, and maybe it's not just obesity, but, but in the focus of this article is that reactive approach to obesity. So I was hoping you could start off by telling our listeners um, or just elaborating on these two different approaches, the reactive and the proactive, and share any insights um, that you have from your kind of years of experience looking into this phenomenon. Who wants to take that? Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, first question to kick us off. Um, so I'll start and then Chloe, Jeanette, feel free to jump in. Um, but from my perspective, a reactive approach, it really focuses on the management and maintenance of one's health um, once obesity has been acquired. So they have um, a diagnosis of obesity. In contrast, a proactive approach um, can also be referred to as uh, primary prevention, and this um, focuses on minimizing the onset of a health condition such as obesity. Um, so pulling from um, the American Occupational Therapy Association's um, official document or position statement on the promotion of health and well-being, um, a proactive approach really emphasizes primary prevention, which can involve education and health promotion efforts designed to prevent the onset and reduce the incidence of um, unhealthy conditions or injuries. So as OTs, I believe we're, we're uniquely trained to help people modify you know, their physical and social environments as well as their everyday habits and routines um, to reduce or prevent risk factors from occurring. So one example, and then Chloe, Jeanette, you can add in some other examples that I think we briefly mentioned in our piece, but 
um, you know, postmenopausal women. Um, occupational therapies could really play an important part in helping um, this uh, group of individuals establish a walking routine um, to help minimize um, weight gain as one example. Chloe, do you have another example you maybe want to share? Yeah, I think a couple other populations that we had talked about are um, women like post-pregnancy and like um, creating and maintaining um, healthy routines in that season, especially when you're having transitions with a new new infant um, and creating um, some habits that maintain um, appropriate weight within that new season of time. Also, we had mentioned in the article um, sedentary jobs and having potentially um, interventions from an OT that support um, maybe movement breaks um, or standing desks that um, make it so that the individual isn't um, in that sedentary role all day long. Which reminds me, I'm going to put my standing desk up because I'm <laughs> sedentary. Perfect, perfect <laughs> example, Beth. Thank you. <laughs> um, and this may be a loaded question, but I'm curious, given the literature, and you provided some of this in in the article, is is what makes the U.S. unique from the rest of the world in terms of our high prevalence of obesity and our approach to care. Are are there, I mean, I know there are differences in prevalence, but are there also differences in other, or other factors that contribute to that? And I don't know if Jeanette, you wanna take that on because you have maybe a broader perspective. Yeah, well, thank you. Before I say too much, I would like to say that a part of my family actually live in the US. My, <laughs> my, my, my aunt and uncle actually moved over there. So I have a lot of family over there as well. So just to be easy about that. Um, and the American population is actually, many of them actually ancestors from Europeans who went to the US. So we're very connected still. But I think a, a great part of this, it's still our different healthcare systems. Um, uh, for example, in Scandinavia, but also in the whole top of Europe, it's a bit different when you go to the, the lower parts of Europe. and But also other places actually both in the Asian countries in Australia as well. I have corporations there in New Zealand. Um, we have kind of another system who builds on welfare in another way. And I know um, from, from my home backyard, we um, all hospitalization is free. So you go to the hospital, we all are dedicated to a GP. So we can go to our GP whenever you like, it's cost free. Um, we're not uh, afraid to get cancer of any kind of uh, diseases because then we will just um, come to the hospital. It's all for free because we pay a lot of tax. So, of course, that's very expensive on the one hand. And that's why I think we pay so much attention on prevention, because it's actually uh, we, we need to prevent to be very sick because we can't afford it uh, as a society. And I think that's why we really are trying to keep the uh, prevalence down. And at the moment, about 15% um, of the Danes are obese. That means BMI over uh, 30. And now about 50% are actually uh, overweight over BMI over 25. So it's, it's increasing actually still. Uh, it's now it's lowering, the curve is actually kind of bending now, but it has been increasing, uh, but it's not nearly the same as the numbers in the US. But I think in the entire um, in the entire European countries as well, also as Australia, other places, um, we, we give much more attention on preventions because uh, hospitals and GPs are an, another, we access them in another way that you do in the US. I think that's that's a huge part of the explanation, actually. Yeah, and I and I just want to quickly add to that too. I think um, CMS here in the United States, like in July, they just you know had a press release where um, they're going to focus more on health health equity and mm -hmm. um, release some more preventative focused billing codes, which mm -hmm. I think will help a lot of 
different provider types. Um, you know, with expanding behavioral health services, for example, and giving access to more populations just based on like disparities that we're seeing in our country um, to services to help them um, prevent the onset of obesity. So I think change is coming. Yeah. And then another another small thing now as OTs, we, we pay a lot of um, uh, focus on, on environment and on context. Um, so in every city, in most of Europe, not just in Denmark, we're very aware that people are able to walk, are able to bike. So we have much more easily access to physical activities. It's it's much easier accessible. Um, uh, we have students from uh, uh, USC um, once a year, and they are always taking pictures because we have actually bike lanes with uh, small, <laughs> where we have these lights with bikes on, so they know it's from bikes. So, and so it's kind of parallel, you know, all around where you have for the cars and you have on the bikes. So it's it's the system is built very differently as well. Um, so I think it's it's part of why it's it's easier to um, gain weight in the U.S. than it is um, in most part of Europe. That's cool. I always wondered the difference, you know, between everyone around the world in different areas. Um, so it's very interesting to hear. So in your article, you identify some initiatives related to primary and preventative care, which you kind of touched on briefly, um, mm -hmm. and how that there are like fairly new um, and provide opportunities for preventative inter interventions to be reimbursed. Um, can you share a little bit more about these initiatives and how they could benefit um, with the OT profession? Uh, so one of the initiatives that we had talked about in our paper was um, the comprehensive healthcare reform law enacted in March of 2010, um, also known as the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And um, this has certainly placed a greater national healthcare priority in preventative services. Um, specifically, Section 2713 of that um, states that private health plans must provide coverage for a range of recommended preventative services and that they can't impose cost sharing with like co-payments or deductibles or co-insurances. Um, so ultimately, this is really encouraging because it means that many preventative services are becoming more financially accessible to patients. Um, maybe not quite to what they are in Denmark, but this is a really positive step for, for um, our healthcare system, I think. Um, some of the preventative services that are covered um, under that include type 2 diabetes screenings, diet counseling, um, as well as obesity screening and counseling. And this could be really beneficial to OTs talking about um, addressing this um, area um, because um, obesity screening and counseling could possibly provide a potential umbrella for OTs to work within to be reimbursed for um, addressing um, subjects like weight management. So encouraging, encouraging step for us that um, as you know, Beth shared with um, those new billing codes and um, the changes that we've seen with the Affordable Care Act, I think making making preventative care more more reimbursable. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's probably where some people's heads go is like, well, I'm interested in this, but how do I get paid to do it? And so that's mm -hmm. obviously going to be a factor. Um, but it is exciting that some of these preventative services could be covered. But then, you know, kind of the follow up question becomes, what do those services look like? Uh, how do we know that they'll be effective? What, what do we actually do? And in the article, you highlighted two programs, and um, these have already kind of been mentioned, but the Lifestyle Redesign Program, which was developed at USC, and the Do It Intervention um, out of Denmark. And so what are, if you could tell us, what are some of the features that make these programs useful for preventing obesity or potentially useful? Um, do they have similarities? Are they very different? But what are the takeaway pieces that you think are really salient that, that could be implemented more broadly? 
Yes, yeah, so actually, um, we we looked at lifestyle redesign, and we actually were very inspired of what you did um, from what Florence Clark did. And and normally, I'm also employed at um, the GPs, uh, the general the research unit of uh, general practitioners. So I work very closely with doctors. And what has been happening within both prevention and and actually how to treat obesity also in Europe has been kind of only diets and exercise. So in different ways, more exercise, more diets. And that has been focused and it has been placed on the individual itself all the time. So, but but we, we don't live as an individual. Uh, so it's very difficult to, to change as individual. And I think you actually had, had very focused on that because lifestyle redesign, you know, focus on strategies and opportunities actually to increase the sustainable changes also which then can promote physical activity and psychosocial health because it it focuses on barriers and options and on existing habits and routines primarily by self analyzing and reflections about relationship between activity and health and well-being of every day's um one's everyday life and that's a very different take when we meet patients, uh, actually start with them, talk to them about um, if if their life were, how would they really love their life to be? And if they can kind of envision that, that is, that is our goal. And we look at that 24 hours a day. So we, and, and figure out in, in which um, bouts can we actually put in different kind of activities and how can we change their way of living? And they actually with them the entire way. It's not um, just you have to eat less, you know, you have to exercise more. We're kind of very operational. How do you say that? Do it very um, um, clear to them how they're actually step by step going to change the way. And it's it's a very OT way of thinking it. And that's actually, I think, really help. And, and that's also what we did in the other studies. And what has been specially about that take has that they have lost a lot of weight, but three years after they had actually sustained the lost weight. And I think it's because we actually changed their way of living. We're not just saying you need to do what I say you need to do. So it's a very different take. So it's not it's not very differently to other kind of patients. These are these are just patients who are also having a lot of um, problems in their everyday life. I guess it's a follow up that and, and Chloe or Beth, if you if you had more to add, feel free to do so. Um, it sounds like in your model, Jeanette, it, it's um, it's partnering with the GPs in that primary care realm. Um, I was wondering if from a U.S. healthcare perspective, we could think about where would this be occurring? Would it be happening in the primary care clinics? Would it be happening in home as, as part of home health where we're already in the in the patient's natural environment. Is it a private practice sort of thing that somebody could take on and start their own particular program? Um, where do you all envision, as you've kind of dreamt and, and thought about this, where do you see it fitting or does it fit in multiple places? I, I guess in my mind, I think primary care definitely demonstrates a lot of potential for addressing this, especially since Primary care services are often integrated with interprofessional teams and they're accessible to patients. So I think in terms of um, applying like more preventative approaches, that setting um, is really conducive for that. Um, however, I also recognize that in the US, we don't have a lot of OTs that are practicing in primary care settings. So advocating for um, the need for OTs to address weight uh, concerns in this space, um, I think is important, but we also don't have many OTs there yet. Um, so I, I really do believe that this could be an aspect of OT's plan of care really in any setting. Um, you know, as Jeanette was kind of discussing in the um, interventions that she was describing, um, 
you know, weight is just one aspect of health. It's not that we're, we as OTs are going to be zooming in on weight alone. We acknowledge that, you know, weight is housed within like so many factors um, for an individual. And so, you know, considering that as just a, an aspect of your intervention and uh, a perspective of your plan of care, I think that could occur really in any setting. Um, especially because the the prevalence of obesity um, and um, overweight individuals is such in the United States that um, most settings where we're treating patients, we're probably going to encounter someone um, where this is an acknowledgement. Yeah, and just like <clears throat> expanding a little bit more on what Chloe said, I mean, I agree, I think these prevention efforts should be threaded throughout the care continuum. Um, you know, as a as a faculty member, I consider my research my practice. So I think too, you know, with a lot of our community engaged scholarships, like as a researcher, I think it's my professional responsibility to go out and educate um, different communities um, and create opportunities for them to learn some of those components that Jeanette was describing that are part of these evidence-based and informed programs like lifestyle redesign and do it um, so that individuals at least have those resources to go and explore more or ask their primary care providers, you know, how do I get access to an occupational therapist? Um, and I also think OTs can, can do more with um, consultant work as well um, and work with various nonprofits uh, to really bring our value forward and help address some of these these factors that everyone's mentioned today. Can I say something shortly? Uh, what we discussed now in Denmark and what I think could be a US model as well is actually having OTs as well in the GP clinics. Uh, so the GP is primarily kind of healing and giving medicine to people. And if they more have a kind of preventive um, issue, they will be referred directly to a part of the clinic where there are either nurses or OTs. And that's what we're starting to see in Denmark as well. But other, um, the GPs also refer to the health centers where they can have this um, evidence-based intervention. So there will be, there ought to be a direct link from hospitals or GPs to the health center. So I think it should be on the health center to the general population of court, you can also target it specialized populations within um, within work settings or uh, among yeah situations at schools or high schools or other places. But I think the refer system will be uh, a growing thing. If nothing else, we're all gonna leave this talk being really jealous of your healthcare system. Um, but yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's that's amazing. I love just the connectedness of it. Sabrina, you want to jump in? I think you have the next question. Yeah. So you kind of all highlighted this a little bit about how many OTs and OT students don't have really the experience or know much about providing preventative services with individuals with obesity or those who are at high risk. Um, is there information lacking at the entry level education? part of it or is it more of a specialty area that would require continuing education and even maybe certifications for example the lifestyle redesign approach that you guys mentioned in your article great question sabrina um so as an occupational therapy educator i mean i think it's both i think um entry level occupational therapy be doctoral programs, you know, those that have them. Um, it's not yet, as all of us know in the U.S., not mandated here. Um, but for entry-level OTD programs, um, we should be emphasizing this because it is a standard. Um, and I think in our paper, we say the standard, but don't actually like define it. So it's standard B.3.4. I know them really well um, right now. So this is all about um, applying scientific evidence to explain how occupation is balanced, um, the role of occupation specifically in promoting health, um, and, pre and preventing disease, injury um, for persons, groups, and uh, populations. So 
we have to be doing it um, for our accreditation standards. Um, how we do it is going to look different across programs. Um, I always think there's opportunity for improvement and growth. Um, like for our uh, entry level OTD program, I teach a population health and wellness course. And we talk about various social determinants of health and how those influence or shape various um, care experiences, um, health effects, et cetera. Um, but that's just one example within our program. I also would love to see, you know, our professional association, AOTA, um, maybe create some, um, like we have uh, advanced certification. So I have an advanced certification in gerontology. I would love to see an advanced certification in prevention or um, chronic disease or health management. Um, or maybe health promotion and wellness. I think we're going to be shifting that way in the years to come as CMS and um, other uh, settings are starting to realize that we have to address some of these things earlier on um, because our system's just overburdened. We don't have the workforce, so we have to do something um, right from the very beginning. Yeah, I agree. That would be cool to kind of incorporate more things like that. So in your article, you mentioned that many OTs identify their role as more of a secondary or tertiary in the whole prevention process. How can OTs and OT students kind of um, prepare for and advocate for having that primary role? How do we get in the door? How do we say we want to be the ones in the GP's office or we belong in these spaces? Is there an advocacy piece? And is that is that the individual's role? Does that need to happen more at AOTA or or I'm thinking like political action things even to 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 make this stuff more policy, right? How does it happen? Chloe, how does it happen? This is like your dream, right? This is what you want to see. How do you make it happen? I definitely think that um, education is a huge part of it. Um, you know, Beth just mentioned, you know, educating ourselves as practitioners is really important. But then also, I think there's two other groups that really need to know what we are capable of in a primary prevention role. And that's the patients that we're treating and that's the other professionals that we're working with. Um, I, I think that a lot of times patients might not be aware that OTs can act in a preventative capacity. A lot of times we're known for the role we play in re rehabilitation settings. Um, and similarly, I think a lot of um, practitioners who are referring to us might not know um, our capabilities in terms of having preventative roles with our patients. So I think educating um, the team members that we're working with is huge. Um, if our primary, primary referral source is from physicians, we really should be educating them about what we can be doing um, from a preventative angle so that we can be seeing patients um, early on in their healthcare tra trajectory before they have three or four comorbidities that we're trying to rehabilitate and knowing that, um, hey, you can refer to us earlier on and we can serve a purpose here. Um, so yeah, I think there's definitely a role um, at the policy level, but I think too, just like starting, starting smaller and just educating those around us that we're working with and um, treating is really, really important. And, and right as practitioners that are, um, you know, listening to this, write your local state representatives. Like as part of my courses, like I have my students practice writing to their representatives for, you know, changes that they want to see within their, their settings of care and for the populations that they serve. So, I mean, I mentioned earlier CMS released, you know, this behavioral health strategy and proposed new rules for coding and billing. Um, and it primarily, from my understanding, um, focuses on like mental health counselors, addiction counselors, but there could be more of an emphasis on occupational therapy um, within behavioral health and, and strengthening primary care delivery. 
And we should, if we should actually, uh, what, what we are trying to do, um, and thank you, Stacey, it's not that all OTs just are, or GPs just refer to OTs. That's what we would like to do in the future. They do that sometimes, but not all of them at all. So it's not that well functioning at the moment. But um, what we are trying to do is really um, to show the evidence based of what we can actually do. And that has been a shift, and we have been presenting OT's work at um, health ministers, at GP conferences around the world, where we can actually hardcore show these data, that we can make people kind of lose the same weight, but we can actually um, make them sustain the weight, because we have this very different approach, where we start on looking you know, of people's habits, of people's occupational balance, of people's relations and who can actually help them, who will be a barrier, actually. So we are having a very differently approach. And it now we are on this third study, kind of the next third version, and they can still, they respect the data coming out now because we can show it statistically. And it has really had an impact uh, in Scandinavia. So I think we need also kind of to, to speak the doctor's language as well. So, so well, we get validated in the same way. So we're trying to go through these channels and then through the doctors, through the GPs and make them refer to us. So it's both on a high political level and actually through the hospitals and the doctors to actually make it work. Um, I think that's the way that's the way we can see. And I think it's the same in the US actually. So we have to, it's not enough just to say, yes, we can do it. We actually have to show that we can do it. And then we will be seen both from patients and, and, and GPs and doctors that that they can actually refer um, to this kind of interventions who um, have a, a, a different approach than what we normally have done. Yeah, that is a excellent point. I mean, data speaks across the board to health administrators, to physicians, and to the public at large. And it's amazing that there is data already to back up OT's role in this arena. So yeah, thank you for bringing up that point, Jeanette. Um, we're we're kind of wrapping up, but I, I, I do have, um, I have one more question for you. Um, and, and I have primarily practiced in pediatrics. So this is coming from my pediatrics lens. And I'm just wondering, with obesity, when do these preventative services, when when could they, I'm going to use the word could, not should, but when could they be implemented? Should it start during childhood and adolescence? Um, I, I think, Jeanette, you mentioned schools earlier, that there was some connection to schools. Um, but yeah, I remember working in the school system and already seeing children who were, were clearly at risk for, for being obese as adults or, or were obese as children. And yeah, um, what do, when do we start this? What do we take into account? Uh, that's a great question, Stacey. Um, I think kind of going back to the discussion and the delineation that we had earlier about reactive versus proactive care, you know, we have reactive care across the continuum and we need that. You know, if we get sick, we're going to treat children, we're going to treat adolescents, we're going to treat adults. Similarly, I think proactive care or more preventative care needs to occur across the continuum because there's going to be different things that we need to um, prevent and acknowledge from a preventative angle um, throughout the lifespan. Um, our paper specifically um, is speaking to the prevention of um, obesity in adulthood, just because there are a lot of national initiatives and there's a lot of research being done um, that looks at the primary prevention of pediatric obesity. Um, and I think a lot of times um, primary prevention research and care does look a lot at pediatrics because it's kind of like, you know, we're, we're addressing things early on and that's really important um, before um, kids have a lifetime of like um, health depleting habits ingrained into their routines. Um, however, I, I think it's also important to acknowledge, especially with obesity, that kids and adolescents aren't fully autonomous over their daily routines and habits. So if we only have like this preventative approach towards um, 
kids and adolescents. Um, and then they get to adulthood where they finally have full autonomy over their routines and their lifestyle. Um, I think that that's kind of missing a piece where we, we could really um, come into play and show people how to in, um, implement healthy, healthy habits and routines that are going to sustain health, um, including appropriate weight management throughout the lifespan. Um, so yes, all of the above, I think is the answer. I think, um, prevention just needs to, needs to occur, occur across the continuum. Thanks for that. Sabrina, you want to finish, uh, wrap us up, and then we're going to do a quick party game. Yeah. So um, before we get into our party game, I was just interested in what your guys' future plans include and whether there are any considerations for conducting additional research on this topic or kind of where you're going to go with this. Uh, so I'm currently um, initiating my dissertation research that is really kind of delving into this uh, topic specifically, as you can probably tell. I'm really excited to talk about this subject. So um, my dissertation research um, is definitely exploring this area further. Um, I am really kind of interested in how we as OTs can expand our role here and um, my dissertation research will um, be looking at um, current care practices within primary care settings um, for um, a, OT practitioners who are treating adults and kind of seeing how they are intervening and evaluating um, weight-related concerns. Um, and our outcome of that is that we're actually hoping to use the research to create a clinical decision-making tool that um, will help um, practitioners in that setting with addressing weight-related concerns of patients down the road. Um, so I'm excited about that. I know that Jeanette is also doing a lot of great work, so I'll let her kind of speak about the really fabulous work that she's doing related to obesity and OT right now too. Uh, thank you, Chloe. Um, first of all, I like to, you know, continue the research in US as well. And I look forward to come to Wisconsin in the spring. Uh, but what we're doing here that we're actually trying afterwards to spread around is that the Do It study now is in trying out an RCT study, uh, the third version, where our overall objective is to develop this occupational therapy weight loss program and prevention program, which efficiently now leads to sustained weight reduction. With, and the primarily focus is with less limitation in people's everyday life. And that's very differently to what's normally are focused on and a higher quality of life. So we are actually looking in less, um, less limitations and a higher quality. So that's our primarily goal with it. And it will firstly target these social norms uh, and relations and participation in meaningful everyday activities and habit change. And only secondly, target physical exercise and diets. And we're actually doing this by looking at these social norms because we can now see within the earlier studies that um, it, it, is, it's, it is next to impossible to change the way of living if your entire family or your entire society where you are closely connected lives in another way. And actually some even in Denmark has described when they have lost about um, 25, uh, no, it must be about 100 pounds. They say it is like I'm, an, you know, I'm a criminal and I can't live in the same neighborhood anymore. I have to kind of move away, not just to, to gain weight again. So it's really focusing now on social norms and on context. And we're looking into the, uh, the research area of social prescribing. So how can we now for people who are not in kind of the, the a healthy context, how can we prescribe them to uh, more another context where they can actually have the help that they're seeking? And, and the finally thing that that in Denmark now we have developed, uh, Denmark is um, where Novo Nordisk is actually coming from. And uh, they are developed, uh, these are uh, WIGOI and Ozempic and obesity uh, medications. 
And we can actually see we can make now people, after losing weight, after medications, we can make them sustain that. But as Chloe said one day that we talked, then why, why do we have to lose weight and then sustain it? Why not just from the beginning, just sustain it? And she's perfectly right. So I think that would be our, our next focus. And this is actually the focus now. So how can we make people change their life and increase their lifestyle and increase their quality of life uh, from the beginning without being sick first and then being well? So, and I think that's a very, looking at relations and in context and meaningful activities, that's, that's the kind of the OT approach into this area. It's fabulous. And I think we're all excited to see what comes out of your dissertation, Chloe, and what comes out of these, these other studies that you're all involved in. So we'll, we'll keep an eye out for those. Um, but we are at the point in our in our series where we, we liked, we've had all this rich discussion, intelligent discussion, and now we're going to play a stupid party game. Um, so in thinking about our game for today, um, here in the U.S., it is football season. Um, and I also believe, uh, you know, in, well, in Europe, it's it's football season. So you've got some mm -hmm. soccer going on. So we can kind of adapt this to be international. Um, we're going to ask you uh, a couple questions um, about football or football and um, get to know you a little bit better, okay? So we'll, we'll go round robin, so whoever wants to jump in first. But the first question is, you have a ticket to any football match. What teams do you want to see go head-to-head? -head? What two teams would you want to see play each other? And it could be college, pro, whatever you want to do. Okay, this one I'm going to answer because I know an, like an answer. I'm so bad with football. <laughs> And I'm really hoping my partner, Kevin, uh, does not hear this um, now because I would probably disappoint him. Um, so UW-Madison, we're the Badgers. Go Badgers. Um, and arrival is Ohio the Ohio State. So I would love to see an, uh, that game play out. <laughs> nice. Okay. Chloe, do you have any football preferences? What two teams would you want to see? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I also don't know a lot about football like <laughs> Beth, but um, maybe um, I, I'm drawn to the Broncos and we're close to the Packers. So I feel like the Broncos and Packers would be an interesting matchup. Okay. Jeanette, any, 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 no. they take any football no. matchups that you would want to see? No, no, not in the U.S. I would no, I wouldn't go into. What about because... soccer though? What about uh, Premier League? Yeah, yeah, I know one, one, one football player from Denmark, Pernella Harder, and she played for Chelsea, but she just transferred to Bayern Munich, so I haven't seen her play yet. Do you know who that is? Um, yeah, uh, big no on that. Christina, something maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on to the next question and maybe maybe everybody Thank can you. answer so okay what food or drink are you bringing to the tailgate party so tailgating is like kind of the pre-game party that you have in the parking lot so you're going to go to this big game what food or drink are you bringing to the party I would definitely say chips and guacamole I'm all about the guacamole you can't go wrong there I mean, this is probably not good considering we're talking about primary prevention and weight, but like Wisconsin cheese and beer. Okay. Squeaky cheese curds. <laughs> With the, the local favorites. Okay. Jeanette, any favorite sports foods? Um, well, just to tip in from, from Scandinavia, I think I would bring salty lacrosses just to do something very differently. <laughs> And then we actually eat salty lacrosses without the chocolate or with actually um, chocolate milk. So that goes very well together. <laughs> Can you describe what salty lacrosses are? Uh, that's very strong lacrosse, which um, is very salty. Okay. And, yeah. And, and most um, Americans do very, not like it at all. <laughs> Okay. Well, we'll have yeah. to see if we can order that here in the U.S. No, I want to try it. Um, okay. 
what other foods do you so that's what you're bringing to the party you're in the stadium what again this is a terrible topic for obesity but what stadium foods or drinks are you looking forward to the most I mean, maybe related to our topic, we OTs could play a role in consulting with stadiums to get more healthy <laughs> food options. Full I circle. Love I love there, that. there aren't many. I don't like the stadiums here. I do not see any healthy food options at stadiums. And I don't um, I don't eat meat. So I'm usually like pretzel. That's usually like yeah. the only option. It's, yeah. It's like nachos or pretzel. Right. <laughs> Our preventative OT recommendation would be to sneak your own snacks in your purse. <laughs> mm. I love that. Okay. So maybe some like healthy popcorn or carrot sticks that you're bringing <laughs> into the stadium with you. I like that. I and your, your water, obviously you need to hydrate. Of course. Yes. Hydration. <laughs> Do any of you have a favorite tailgate game? Cornhole, can jam, just toss the football. I feel like cornhole is the only one I've played. I, I I like cornhole a lot, but I I haven't played any of other good tailgating games. So that would be all I could speak to. Sabrina, this was your question. What's your favorite tailgate game? Oh gosh, um, probably cornhole would be one of them. Um, kind of depends who's with me for sure. <laughs> <laughs> And Jeanette's gonna have to go look up what cornhole is. It is tossing yeah. a, a beanbag into a, a wooden board. Um okay. All right. Last question. What is your predicted either college football or Super Bowl champion for this year? And we'll we'll come back and award you a prize should your team win. That's a good idea. <laughs> So who's going to win? Or yeah, what? like who's going to win Badger? it all? I mean. Badger's going to win it all? Uh, I'd love to say yes. Um, but we <laughs> also lost. <laughs> we, lost, we lost last week's game. We'll see. They're still, I mean, it's the beginning of the season. I'd probably say Chiefs. They're good. Okay. I'll say Alabama for college. I mean, they're always a good bet. Okay. But Jeanette, any predictions? No, I will totally support Chloe in anything. Yes. Like, okay, uh, so I'm you're going to support that. her. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you guys for playing our game. We have learned that you don't know very much about football, so there's always room for growth in some area. So we have found your area for growth. Um, and obviously, you're working on a PhD, Chloe, so you have more important things to do. <laughs> um, no, it was fun playing. Thank you guys for entertaining us. But to wrap up back to our topic, is there anything else you would like our listeners to know about the work you're doing, uh, resources that you would recommend if somebody was really interested in this topic and wanted to know more? Um, and we can also provide any links to documents uh, when we post the video. So or, or just is there anything else that you want to tell people? I think one resource that I was just going to share is if people are interested in this content. Um, I think that um, looking at the Do It study that Jeanette's team has done would be really interesting. Um, I think it just has a lot of really salient um, um, kind of OT beliefs woven into their intervention. And I think it would be really exciting for a lot of OTs to look at. Fabulous. And we can either post links or, or or provide notes on how to access those articles. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Beth, earlier you recommended the AOTA, you said you referred to the AOTA position statement on health and well-being. Is that the, did I get that right? I tried to jot it down really quickly. Yeah, I think it came out in, Chloe, correct me, because I know you've, I think it was 2018 or 2020. Mm -hmm. um, but the, yeah, AOTA has an official position statement on how OTs, um, can get involved in health promotion and wellness. And in that document, there's some really great definitions of primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, and some examples, not just at the individual level, but groups and population for practitioners to really think about and how they can advocate and make a difference in the setting that they're currently working in. Um, and I'd also encourage people to check out Healthy People 2030 um, and just see what are some of those 
those um, national initiatives and guidelines that are being recommended within our healthcare system. Fantastic. Thank you for all of that. And again, we'll we'll post some links when we um, make the video available so people can find those things easily. Thank you all so much for being here today. We appreciate your insight. We uh, appreciate the work that you're doing. It's obviously so important for all of us um, as a society to do this type of work and to bring awareness to these kinds of issues and, and opportunities. Um, just a reminder to our listener, this article will be open access, um, you know, as a kudos for being on the on the series. Um, so everybody can access this article and um and we hope that, that lots of people will read it and, and get great ideas and continue this kind of work in our field because it's so needed. So thank you all for being here and um, good luck with all your future endeavors. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.